it's okay with you, I'd like to share with you today, not as a congressman, not coming to give a legislative update, but really just talk to you as a brother in Christ who's context who's informed by what's going on in the world around me and what I get to see while serving in Congress. Uh, is that all right with you all today? Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, some of you have seen this before, but I brought a couple family photos since we're among family. In really the most humbling experience of my life, I was sworn in to serve in Congress. And uh, during the ceremony, I had the Bible open to a scripture that said, righteousness exalts a nation. And uh, it was made the comments like, wow, that's odd. We've never seen anybody with the Bible open during the swearing-in ceremony. And, and I simply replied, that, that's odd. I, I think they work better that way. <laughs> um, and the truth is, is that righteousness does exalt a nation. And uh, it's been amazing to be able to serve and to see the kind of things that uh, we've seen so far. When I was running for office, or I should say before I was running for office, I was sitting here in, in service and enjoying life, enjoying our community, loved being a part of it, uh, excited about what was happening in our life and family, and somebody came and said, hey, we think you should run for Congress. And of course, I immediately said, you know, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, that's for, uh, that's for other people. That seems like a big task at hand. But I had told the story a number of times, just encouraging people to get involved in the process and to become who we should be as citizens and especially as uh, people of faith in the context of where we live in our nation. Uh, coming out of the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin was asked, and this is a story I've told, he was asked by Mrs. Paul, he said, good sir, good doctor, do we have a republic or do we have a monarchy? He said, we have a republic if you can keep it. If you can keep it. If you can keep it. We have a job to do. Uh, our form of government requires something out of us. When we were praying about it, I, re I remember Roselle, we were praying about it, and she had a couple thoughts. One was like, oddly enough, I have a piece about this. <laughs> as well as the context. She's thinking, I'm at home, three kids, I'm dealing with all this. And, uh, but really the scripture that came to mind was Joshua 1. And in Joshua 1, God's talking to Joshua, and he says, be strong and courageous. And if that wasn't enough, a few verses later, he says, be strong and courageous. And then we get to verse 9, and he says, haven't I commanded you to be strong and courageous? This wasn't an option. This is a command. And I believe God's calling people at this time and saying, I command you to be strong and courageous. This is a time where we need people to stand up and to be strong and courageous. Many of you have done that already in so many ways. Many of you have served on the front lines. If you're a veteran here and you're able, if you'd like to stand, we just want to honor you today on this Independence Day weekend for what you've done and how you've served our country. And I know there's many at home watching online. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your service. But beyond that, we all have a role and we all have a responsibility that we have to play. We have something that we have to do. It's no doubt that this July 4th we find ourselves, it feels a little different, doesn't it? We have a lot to celebrate. We live in the freest nation. We, we have a heritage that's wonderful. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. We live in a prosperous nation, but we are in challenging times, no doubt. And I know that my heart breaks for the families that are dealing with the COVID, both the economic impact and then the health impacts of COVID. I know that today as we celebrate this weekend, the signing of the declaration, a document that espouse the, the fact that we're all created equal, that we're endowed by God, not by government, but by God with inalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. But I know that we're still working toward that more perfect union. We haven't achieved it yet. We still have a lot of work to do. And that's really evident right now as we celebrate this fourth. But we do have a lot to be thankful for. And as we look at all this, we can see that at the, t at the moment it feels sometimes like we're a broken nation. We are definitely in need of healing. But the good news is today, and you've heard this scripture before, 2 Chronicles 7.14 says this. God says, I will heal your land. But it comes with a little caveat. <laughs> it says, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then while I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. It says, if. If who? If my people. If my people. You know, I said before that righteousness exalts a nation. And that is so true. 
If you're looking to Washington for the answer, let me tell you something. There's a, there's a joke in Washington that the first six months you get to Washington, you're like, wow, looking around, you're in the Capitol, you're going to work, there's walking the halls of history. There's a joke that says, you know, the first six months you're like, how did I get here? The second six months you're looking around going, how did everybody else get here? <laughs> if you're waiting for Washington to produce the answer for you, let me tell you, You'll be waiting for a while. We have a responsibility to do, and believe me, I don't take that lightly. We need to be weighing the legislation. We need to be weighing public policy, doing all those kind of things. But the thing that I understand is that if we had perfect laws but a corrupt people, we still have a poor nation. But we can have good-hearted people who are doing the best in every community, in every church, in every town throughout this country with imperfect laws, and we still have a great nation. John Adams said it like this. He said, we have no government armed with the power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And so our form of government requires something out of us. You know, the glory of the American Revolution wasn't the fact that we had a new government. It's that we had a free people that we had people who could dream big and set out to achieve things and to live free and to practice their faith free and, and to, to have commerce and families and do all the things that we, we hold dear in, in, in our nation. It, we are a nation defined by the people. We, the people. And so it's important that we understand that we have a role, we have a a duty if we're going to see this nation continue on and be the nation that we're called to be. You know, recently, um, my wife and I had a, a chance to take a congressional de delegation trip to Israel. Uh, truly an amazing trip. We got to meet uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other leaders in different facets. When the Ramallah uh, stood on the Golan Heights, looked at all the different things with the issues that are facing that region. Uh, but we also had the chance to stand on a road, and the guy told us, he said, you know, the, the probability that Christ walked this road is approximately 100%. You know, and it's, it's amazing to sit there in, in that land and just to, to take all that in in the context of what's going on politically in the world, but then you're in the, the cradle of history almost, and it's just, it, it was an amazing experience. But if you've ever been to Israel, you almost trip over history everywhere you go. And so we're on a bus trip actually going from some place to some place, and the driver's like, oh, by the way, if you look out your window to the right and to the left, you'll see a couple hills. This is the valley where, uh, the valley of Elah, Elah, where David fought Goliath. <laughs> we're like, stop the bus, literally. <laughs> so we got out and spent some time in that valley. Uh, right now there's a road where the river would have been, and this is a, a picture of what it would have been like. The Philistines would have been on one hill, and the Israelites would have been on the other. But then some time after that, I was reading in my daily Bible reading and came across the scripture. It said, 1 Samuel 17, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled. And then it goes on to say, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah. And for some reason, I've read that scripture many times, but it just struck me different in a sense. And I really saw the church or the camps as a metaphor for the church. And by that, I mean the church nationally, you know, where we are globally. And the camp is a great place to find healing. It's a great place to find food. It's a great place to be trained and to skill. We all have a job in the camp to keep the camp going. But how many of you know the purpose of the camp is not the camp? The purpose of the camp is the battle. And our job as a church is to be training people to go out and to be ready to fight the battle. We can't just sit here and expect that things are going to be okay. We have a job to do. Christ said it this way. He said, I will build my church and you'll meet godly friends that will bless your life. And <laughs> How many of you know that's true? How many of you experienced that personally? I know I have. It's like... I'll build my church and you'll get godly teaching that'll make you make sound wisdom, wise decisions in life. That's true too. But what he said was, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, some of us have read that scripture and understood it, but we've read gates as if that was a weapon of war. And so we've thought and had, had the scripture in the context of gates coming after us and by the gates not prevailing, we're defending against them. But how many of you know the only way that gates cannot prevail 
They're not a weapon of offense, they're a weapon of defense. So if they're not prevailing against the church, it's because the church is on the advance and the gates of hell cannot hold back what the church is doing in the nation, in our communities, in the world around us. That's what that scripture is talking about. I find it interesting that when we come to the end of time and we're standing before God in Revelation 2, he doesn't go to the state legislature at Ephesus. To the Senate in Philippi, I have this to say about you. <laughs> he says, to the church, to the church, I want to talk to you about your community. I want to talk to you about what you accomplished in there. And I, I'm thankful to be part of a church that's doing something, I can tell you that. We have a wonderful wonderful history and a heritage but we have to understand the authority we've been given and the heritage we've been given the mayflower compact said this it said heaven undertaken for the glory of god and the advancement of the christian faith george washington said this he said religion and morality are indispensable supports of our nation benjamin rush said this without religion there can be no virtue without virtue there can be no liberty and liberty is the object and life of all republican governments Benjamin Franklin said this, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. And Thomas Jefferson reminded us, he said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we remove their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are a gift from God, that they're not to be violated but by his wrath. I indeed tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. We are in challenging times in as a nation, but we have a lot to be thankful for, a lot to be grateful for, a lot to be proud of. This is the only nation that has saved the world from global tyranny, not once, twice. The ideologies that this nation were founded on have done more to lift more people out of poverty, not only here at home, but around the world than any other ideology. It's invented more cures, it's provided more opportunity, and it's been a bright, shining beacon of freedom around the world more than any other philosophy. The foundation of this nation has done that for more people than anything. And so, while I know that we are still working toward a more perfect union, I can tell you I can stand here on July 4th weekend, Independence Day, and let you know that I'm certainly proud to be an American. And I hope that you are too. But we have to remember that what we have inherited is not guaranteed to be passed to the next generation. Ronald Reagan reminded us, he said, freedom, liberty, it doesn't automatically pass in the bloodstream. It has to be fought for. It has to be protected. It has to be defended. It has to be passed on to the next generation to do the same. And so we have a responsibility to take what we've learned, improve it, and pass it on to the next generation. But I think it's important that as we, as believers, we have to understand as we weigh the issues before us, we have to address it in the context. We need to be willing to study. We need to be willing to look beyond just the specific issues. And certainly, let me tell you this, I've sat in the meetings and then watched the news and been like, were you guys in the same meeting that I was? <laughs> um, you, you gotta get beyond a tweet. You gotta get beyond a post. You got to study history. You got to st understand your theology and understand what the what's happening in the world around us and the forces that are in play because we are truly in a battle not only for the soul of this nation but for the world. And if you doubt that, I want you to think about what this world would look like and the kind of harm it would bring to every individual and family if a communist China ended up having the influence over the world that this nation has had. Uh, so we have a job to do. We have to hold the line. We have to stand up. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Alex, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn. <laughs> I can't say it right. Solzhenitsyn. 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 There you go. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. You got that at home. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, he said this. He, he was a World War II Soviet Union veteran. He spent years in the gulag and labor camps and, um, for criticizing Stalin. He ended up winning the 1970 Nobel Peace Prize, but he said this. He said, to destroy a people you must first sever their roots. Karl Marx said this, the people without a heritage are easily persuaded. And Alexander said this as well. He said, I've spent well near 50 years working on the history of our Russian Revolution. In the process, I've read hundreds of books, collected hundreds of personal testimonies, and I've already contributed eight volumes in my own toward the effort of clearing away the rubble left by that upheaval. 
But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I cannot put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God, and that's why all this has happened. Now, if you've done a little study of history, you understand that the Russian Revolution introduced this concept of Marxism throughout the world, which led to over 60 million, 61 million Russians being murdered, 78 million Chinese murdered, and 200 million people worldwide, their lives destroyed in the last century. So our ideologies matter. What we're standing for matters. What we're standing for has an impact on our communities and on the world around us. And it's our job not to shirk back in times of this, but to stand up and say, we have the answer. We have a duty. We have a responsibility to stand up. And so here's what I want to ask you to do today. You know, we have a job, first of all, to pray. Scripture tells us, if my people call by name will humble themselves and pray, we have to pray. We have to be on our knees asking for God to do a work in our families, in our communities, in our country, and indeed the world. We need to vote in every election. If you look at some of the elections that happen, you know, people show up for a presidential election, but many of the elections for school boards, for city, community, for water districts, <laughs> uh, are, are decided by a handful of people in the communities. And if you compare that to the people who are sitting in pews on a Sunday morning, uh, it, it's a great disparity. And so there's no reason for the church to have an influence in the world. If we lose our culture, it's because we have not done our job. We need to stand up. We need to pray. We need to vote. And we have to engage. We have to engage. We have to do the work of voting, of, being, of studying, of, of doing the due diligence to, to understand what we have to, to be involved in the concepts, to go to city council meetings, to do everything that we need to do to have a voice, to be the salt and light to be the, 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 Christ talked about it, don't hide your can, you're under a bushel. Let it out there. Let it out there. Let it be seen and make a difference. You know, when I'm processing the issues of the time, there's a couple questions I always ask, and the first one is this. It's, what's God's heart for everyone involved in this issue? And I can tell you, there are forces at play that want to corral everyone in this room into group A or group B on every issue, and most issues are multifaceted. You know, we'll, we'll find a little thing of this, and oh, you must be in this group, and therefore you have to, when truly uh, most of the issues that we're facing are very complex, and you have to get in them and understand what are the legitimate issues, what are the illegitimate issues, what's real, what's not real, and really dig in and do our homework and solve these things. And believe me, as, as someone whose role and task is to set public policy, that's my job, and I take it very seriously. But the first job, if you're thinking this way, you're thinking, I see a problem in my community, and my first thought is the White House. We've missed the point. Because our nation of the people, by the people, for the people, we all have a responsibility. So when I'm seeing an issue in the community, my first question is, what's God's heart for everybody involved? Secondly, what's my personal responsibility in this as a citizen, as a person of faith? Can I do anything in my community to help? Do I know anybody you know, who can help in this situation. Sometimes we feel like because we can't do everything, we shouldn't do nothing. But we can all do something. And if we all did something, we could solve some of these problems that seem so big in our nation. And so we all have a role to play. We have a responsibility. We have to do something. We have to be involved. We have to vote. We have to pray. We have to engage. We have to show up. Uh, we have to be involved in this process. I was reading, uh, if you're reading along with me in the daily Bible reading study, you probably came across this scripture this week if you're on the same plan as me. But Hezekiah said this. Uh, Hezekiah, he didn't say this. Let me back. Hezekiah had a mighty king in Israel. God had done amazing things in his life. He had used him, worked through him and with him to deliver Israel from from enemies and those kind of things. But then, uh, right after God came and extended Hezekiah's life, he, there was a convoy that came from Babylon. And Hezekiah went and he showed them the temple treasuries, showed them everything, showed them the, all through the palace, where the weapons were stored, everything. Uh, and then the prophet Israel comes to him after that incident. He says this. He said, Hezekiah, the time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who are born to you, will be taken away. 
will be taken away. How many sounds like that's a bad word? How many of you would feel bad if that word came to you? Now, what's amazing is Hezekiah's response. He said this in the next verse. He said, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good because at least I'll have peace and security in my lifetime. Now, as believers, as Americans, we can look at the landscape and we can see what's going on in the world. We can see the trends that are happening in our nation. We can look at $28 trillion of debt and we can say, well, at least we have peace and security in my lifetime. But the thing that's made America what it is and what we certainly have a responsibility as believers to do is to care about the next generation. We have to be involved in the process. Don't let us be the generation that says, well, at least it won't happen to me. At least we'll have peace and security in my lifetime. We may lose our footing as a nation and the, the amazing promise of America and everything that the founding meant and what the ideas that were released into the world to provide freedom and prosperity and hope to mankind. Those ideas may fall away, but at least I had peace and security in my time. At least my road was easy. Let's not be those people. Ezekiel 22, 30, God said this. He said, I looked for someone among them who will build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of a land so I would not have to destroy it, but I could not find anyone. I could not find anyone. Let's be found. Let's be found. I'll give you one more scripture. Uh, again, I was a church born and bred kid, read through this many times. The Israelites are coming out of Egypt. They come, <laughs> headed to the promised land. They come across a little roadblock, the Red Sea. Um, can't cross it. Uh, and if you remember a scripture, if like me, you remember a scripture from Sunday school, this is the one you remember. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch. The Lord will rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. And that's true. There are seasons like that where God fights. He'll do the battle. We need to wait. But some of us just really like that season, the stand still and watch. Lord, I'm willing to, I will stand here and watch you do it all. I, I, thank you, Lord. That's my calling. That's my gift, ministry gift. It's a, the, I'm, I'm part of the stand still and watch ministry group. <laughs> But the next verse, and somehow at least seems we've overlooked this, it says, Moses goes to God and it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to move. <laughs> so we have a decision to make today. Are we going to be in the stand and still and watch club or are we going to be in the let's get moving club? It's time for us to get moving. Because the thing that God knows, sometimes we're saying, hey, God, I want to stand still and watch you move. And he's saying, I will. But here's the thing I need. I can't open the waters till you start marching toward the sea. I can't shut the mouth of the lion's den until I have somebody like Daniel who's willing to, when people say, you can't pray in public anymore, go up and he opens the windows and the first thing he does is he prays in public. Somebody like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we all want God to be with us in the fire, but not many of us. Maybe you want to stand up when everybody else is kneeling down in a culture. This is what it's going to take. You know, you have Esther. How many are willing us to put everything on the line because we might think, maybe, perhaps, God's appointed me for this time. Maybe for such a time as this, God wants you. God wants you. God's calling you. And certainly the signers of our Declaration of Independence, as we celebrate this week, the signing of that Declaration of Independence in the context of their time, they were signing their death warrant. They were signing a document that the most powerful force in humanity considered treason at the time. And they knew that they were pledging their lives, their prosperity, their sacred honor in order to pass on this idea, this concept of liberty to the next generation and ensure it indeed for generations to come and we're all benefits and blessings of that. Sometimes God, I think, is looking for somebody like Samuel who when he calls will just say, here I am, Lord, send me. Whatever it is, whatever it is, God, whatever it is you want me to do, send me. The thing that I've learned over time is that the greatest calling 
is simply obedience. Simply obedience. You know, I was born and bred in the church kid, and you hear about the five-fold ministry and all that kind of thing, and some of us are called into that, and if you are, you better do it. But some of us are called to shine and be salt and light wherever we are. We need good, godly data programmers. We need good, godly journalists. We need good, godly engineers. We need good, godly people who are going to stand up wherever we are and be salt and light wherever we are. And we need to have the courage to do it. When it's easy to just stand still and be quiet, we can do it with the love of God. We can do it, but we have to understand the authority we walk in. Scripture tells us that greater is the one in you than the one that's in the world. I know Pastor remembers Peter Daniels. Y'all probably don't know who he is, but he came here and spoke one time. But he had a saying. He said, you know, we Christians across the world will sing about faith, we'll talk about faith, we'll pray about faith, and we'll find the most secure job. We'll <laughs> find the safest social group to hang around with. <laughs> it's time for us to live bold. <laughs> God's in us. The Spirit of God in us. And know that just like Elisha, it may seem like our city is surrounded by forces of darkness. But there's an army that we can't see that's even greater. <laughs> and so I find it interesting that, again, as we celebrate Independence Day, you know, most national anthems end with some bold proclamation about their country. Our country is the greatest and we will last forever. God save the queen. Or <laughs> something along those lines. Ours ends with a question. It says, Oh, say, does that star spangled banner still wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave? And that's a couple different questions to me. Does it still wave? And is it over the land of the free and the home of the brave? And I will say that those two concepts are intricately woven together. We can't have freedom without bravery. And so we have to ask it with every generation that's gone before, and we have to do our job to answer that question for our generation and pass it on for the next generation to do the same. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner still wave over the land of the free and the home of of the brave. I know that we have a nation worth preserving. I know that we have a foundation of heritage that's worth passing on. That doesn't mean it's been perfect. God knows we still have to keep working, like I said, toward that more perfect union. We have a lot to still move forward, but there's been no brighter beacon of freedom and hope. Nothing that's put us on the path more than the principle that this nation was founded on. And so today, I just pray that you join with me and others and continue the work of praying, of voting, of engaging, of being a light, of being salt and light everywhere we go, knowing that greater is the one who's in us than he that's in the world. And let me just say, for my wife and for my family again, thank you so much. It's meant so much to be a part uh, of a church family that's loved us. Thank you for your prayers as we've gone to, to serve in, in Washington. And um, it's meant the world. You've been a great strength to us. So thank you very much. God bless you.